I'm Brian Rowett and I'm talking today about parts theory, which is different parts of us that influence the way we feel and the way we believe. The title is about parts that ruin you or run you. And I was telling a friend of mine the other day that I was coming to talk to some hypnotherapists about this concept. And he came to me this morning and he was talking and he, he looked a bit different to how he normally looks. He said, well, I'm not sure to ask you that, but how does it help hypnosis help your private parts? <laughs> so if any of you here have that same uh, belief, it's actually incorrect. Um, I, I wanted to, there's a few things I'd like to do during the time. I have asked Paul if I could be a bit longer than an hour because often when I do some talks with the questions and things it goes on longer. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about me then I'd like to talk a little bit about the handouts and the therapy that I do and then I want to discuss the parts theory and then I'd like to give some case histories using the parts therapy and lastly if possible if a volunteer or two could come up then I can demonstrate what I mean by the parts therapy. So I'm from Melbourne and yes I was a professional football player, that's Australian football, and um, I was a GP for a long time and then I studied anaesthetics and became an anaesthetist as well. So in the morning I did general practice and people talked a lot at me and I got a headache and didn't feel that great. In the afternoon I did anaesthetics and no one said a word and I was bored to tears looking forward <laughs> to the next day. So in fact it was a pretty good balance. <laughs> and after a number of years of doing general practice, um, the doctors in Melbourne had a thing called a boozy weekend where you could volunteer to go in the country and have a good time and someone would talk about a subject. So I went on that weekend and I didn't know what the subject was but it happened to be hypnosis. And um, we had two days learning about hypnosis which I thought was pretty strange stuff and bought a book um, by John Hartland on hypnosis and he, uh, as Paul said, he suggested we make a pendulum with a bit of string and a piece of plasticine and try and hypnotise any pets that we had. Well I had a cat and a dog so I did this in front of the cat and it scratched me quite badly on the hand <laughs> and I did it with the dog and it just walked away. So I put my book and my pendulum in a drawer and forgot all about it. About a couple of months later, uh, a patient of mine who I knew well said she was studying Italian and she knew the words but when she went to the lecture, the course, she forgot them and could I help? And in those days Valium was used a lot and I said to her, well we can use Valium. I've done this thing called hypnosis, it had no effect on my dog or cat but I can <laughs> try it with you if you like. And she, being an Aussie, said let's give it a go. So. I got the book out looking up under Italian but there was nothing there under Italian. <laughs> so it had a thing called ego strengthening or relaxation. So I read it and turned the pages hoping she wouldn't hear me turn the pages and she came back saying it worked very well and she did remember the Italian. And she then referred me to someone who had headaches and I looked, headaches was in the book so I was okay. And <laughs> she got some benefit too and then suddenly I got taken over by <coughs> hypnosis and everywhere I'd go I'd hypnotise people at dinner and you know I, I got consumed by it and formed a hypnosis group. Um, I was going to have uh, education with a professor of psychiatry with a group and he would talk, uh, we'd go along to the hospital and the, the three hour session and he'd say right we're going to do induction today and this induction will be walking downstairs until they go into trance. So we spent two hours walking downstairs and going to a trance and then the next week we'd go in and say, now this time we're going to do a balloon. We induct you by going up in the balloon and going to a trance. So after about ten of those I said to another guy, I'm not going to go anymore, I'm fed up with induction, I don't know what to do when they're in a trance. So we formed this group and we met every month and talked about hypnosis and he'd, um, he'd been studying with Milton Erickson who's now well known, he wasn't so well known some years ago and he said if you're travelling to America go and see Milton Erickson and attend one of his um, courses that he was running and so I wrote to him and he said that was fine and I 
attended a course for about six days. It was a, it was a strange thing because Milton Erickson was colour blind and had a speech uh, impediment due to polio. So he could only see purple. So any books of Milton Erickson as a rule would have a purple cover. So everyone in the room, all the students had purple clothes on and he had a purple tie and a purple clothes. And some guy pulled up in a purple car and I thought it couldn't be that, but he was. He was <laughs> so Milton Erickson was a very fine man. He spoke, it was difficult to hear what he said because of his speech impediment. And if you asked a question, which I did, he took about an hour in answering it. So I asked him, you know, do you treat cancer with hypnosis? And about an hour later I woke up from, <laughs> I think it was asleep because it was pretty hot, but maybe it wasn't. But one of the things that he did, which has affected me, was there in Phoenix, Phoenix where he was, is a small mountain called Squaw Peak. And he'd ask his uh, patients to go up Squaw Peak and discover what they would discover about themselves. So I and a group of friends went uh, very early in the morning because it was very hot in Phoenix and we started to walk up Squaw Peak and they were way ahead of me because they walked faster. And I said to myself, I better catch up. And then I said, why? I'll go at my own pace. And then I did and I got to them at the end and I have learnt from that experience to do it my way. Whatever I do, it's, it's how I'd like to do it, rather than trying to be Milton Erickson or do something else. And I think it was good advice. I'm not saying that Milton Erickson knew that that's what was going to happen, but it allowed me to open my mind to see what I could learn from that. And then I continued with my general practice and my um, uh, anaesthetic practice for a while and gradually brought hypnosis into it until I was seeing people for an hour for hypnosis. And... Um, there's a difference between um, England and Australia. In Australia, people are not that concerned about hypnosis. They don't seem to see it as a strange thing. And I had um, a drawing on my door saying, with a magician with a wand saying, uh, please be quiet, hypnotist at work. <laughs> when I came to England and set up practice, I had a, a degree, a diploma from Australia, which I hung in the waiting room. And people would come in, you're not going to hypnotise me, are you? You're not going to hypnotise me. So I had to take it down to stop the fear. So there's a, a difference in the way people approach hypnosis or these sorts of things between the two countries. And then I was going to set up practice in fully hypnosis and leave the general practice and I thought I'd have a holiday. So I came here for three months and that was 30 years ago, so I'm still here. So that's why I'm here. And whenever I say to someone I'm from Australia, they say, what are you doing over here, <laughs> so, um, what I would like to start with is to talk about something called the inner world, which is what I believe is a way of looking at what goes inside. I mean, I don't normally use the unconscious as a word because I'm concerned that patients will think of it as something that Freud invented and they've got to be scientific to know it. So I, I talk about the inner world and the inner world that I'm talking about gives us messages and it gives us messages in the form of thoughts, feelings, pictures and words. So with anything that's going on we'll have either or all of thoughts, feelings, pictures or words and those are the things that are influencing how we are as people, what our beliefs are, how we um, feel about things, what we can do. And the, the aim of those four things, thoughts, feelings, pictures and words, is to be accurate, up to date and helpful. So if we have a thought or a feeling that's accurate and it's related to the present and it's helpful, then that's a useful thing. If we have a thought or a feeling that's related to past events and is not applicable to the present, then that's not such a good thing. And most of the patients that come to see us their messages, their thoughts, feelings, pictures and words are not accurate, up to date and helpful. Okay, So our job, one way of looking at our job is to see how we can help them to be more accurate, up to date and helpful. And one of the handouts is about what I think um, the process, I don't know if you have that handout with a diagram, it's a process that goes on within people and I... Um, 
I, sh I give this to the patients. I have a, in my waiting room, I have a, a lot of handouts and they can choose what they want to and the two that I've put in the, in the pack are those. But in, the, in this diagram, it's representing what actually happens in the patient's life or in our lives. So the first column, the experience, is what happens. So we can't really affect that. That's happened. It's either something external that happens to us or it's a thought or a feeling. And that sets off the process. So the middle square is about what's happening in our minds about the experience. So we think about the experience, we remember past experiences, we have our intuition, our belief systems about it, feelings, memories, pictures and self-talk. They all take place instantaneously once the experience happens. And depending on what that process does, that gives rise to the outcome, which might be an action or an emotion or an attitude, a belief or a behaviour. And in a lot of people, the fourth one underneath is that they give themselves a hard time about the outcome. So that's a very simplistic way of looking at how we are treating patients or what it is about patients that has difficulties. Are there any questions about that? Okay. So with the parts theory, we're using that about this process. And one of the various factors of talking with uh, patients is to, in my opinion, is to use clean language. I don't know if you've heard of that term. It's a, it's a form of therapy. A chap called David Grove started. And it's a way of talking without influencing uh, the person because if you say to them, you must feel terrible, then they've got to fight back against you to say, oh, I'm feeling quite good. But if you say, how are you feeling, that gives an opportunity to speak whichever way they like. And communication, which is what's going on between us now and what goes on with us and our clients, is a really important part of therapy, I think. When I see clients and I've seen them for a while and they're better, a few get better, not a lot, but a few get better, then I say to them on the last visit, I say, if you are telling your friend what happened to you when you came to see me that helped you to get better? What would you say? Now, I may have done a lot of techniques. I may have used hypnosis. I may have done past life regression. I may have done lots of techniques. And they all, this is 99.9% .9 of the people that I am saying this to, they look at the ceiling. I'm not sure why. I mean, they're obviously visualising something, but they look at the ceiling and they all say, I think it's just having someone to talk to. Or I think it's just someone listening to me. And that's everyone. So if everyone is saying that, then it seems to me reasonable to be good at doing that. And I think what I'm quite good at is what I call attentive listening, which means I'm listening to what they're saying, I'm noticing the words they're saying, I'm watching their body language, I'm using my intuition as to what vibrations they're giving off, so there are a lot. So we, we get into an empathy. They know that I'm with them, you know, at that level. And one of my soapboxings is that people don't listen. My experience in my personal life is that people don't listen. I don't know if you have that experience. Yeah. And I le I learned that years ago. <laughs> Excuse me. I have a great. I have a part. I have a little man in the back of my head. And he says, tell them that, tell them that. So I often write notes, I never follow them because this guy is pretty good at his job and he tells me what to say. So he just told me something to say. I, I learnt about people that don't listen. I was in Hong Kong for a year um, and I came back from Hong Kong to Melbourne where I live and I met a friend I hadn't seen for a long time and he said, uh, Brian, um, where have you been? And I said, oh, I've been in Hong Kong. He said, oh, my aunt was in Hong Kong a few years ago. She had a great time and then he'd wander off. And I said, oh, I'm doing it. So then I tried it again. I met another friend and he said, oh, where have you been, Brian? I said, I've been in Hong Kong. I've got something made in Hong Kong. I think it's got ivory in it. You must come and have a look sometime. <laughs> so after a while I realised they weren't listening. So the next person, <laughs> sorry, the next person I saw and he said, where have you been? I said, I've been in Hong Kong. Have you ever been to Hong Kong or your aunt or you got any ivory? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I've done for the last 30 years. 
And it's so easy to deflect back if you feel that people are not listening, which I don't think they are. People tell you what you should do. If I were you, I'd do this, and you didn't do that, you should do this. They just don't listen. It's not a criticism. I think it's a reason why we get a lot of our clients. Because they want to talk, but if they talk to someone, they're not listened to. And so I think listening is a really important part of whatever we do. And when Paul was saying they're trying to assess whether it's the person or the therapy, I think that's true. I think a lot of what we do, it's the person. You could have two people doing identical things, but one will get success and the other will get less success. And it's hard to differentiate. It's hard to say it was this or that. Because when someone comes to see me or you, about a hundred things happen. He just told me something else. <laughs> Sorry. Um, a lady rang me up um, a few years ago and she said she'd been trying to get pregnant for six years and she'd had IVF twice, I think. And someone had told her that I may help her by teaching her relaxation. So I said, yes, and I booked her an appointment for three weeks' time. And she came in, very nice woman, I got on well with her, and I did some visualisation to imagine going down to the womb and talking to the womb and talking to the ovaries and, and getting it relaxed and whatever it was. And I said I should see her in two weeks' time, or three weeks' time. So um, she was very pleased and I gave her some, I made a CD for her to listen to. And then about two or three days before the next visit, she rang and said, Dr. Rowett, I'm sorry, but I need to cancel the appointment. And I said, that's fine. I said, why, why are you cancelling? She said, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and I said, that's, that's great news. You know, I, I, that visualisation is pretty good stuff. And she said, it was. I really liked it. In fact, I was pregnant before I came to see you. <laughs> now, I think that the phone call had an effect. Now, I'm not saying it did, but she couldn't get pregnant for six years. We had a phone call and two weeks later she got pregnant. So I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it may be that if you, if you can offload tension or anxiety or worry, it may be that the systems work better inside. And that's why I think listening to people and being empathetic with them and sharing with them um, is, is a good thing for the systems inside. I just saw... Keep quiet. I just saw someone yesterday, a man whom I've seen three times because he's terribly shy, he's in a workforce thing that he hates, he can't be assertive, and a lot of things are going on. And I've seen him and really listened to him and supported him. And he said yesterday, he said, well, it is getting better. In fact, I'm sleeping much better. I haven't slept well for years and I don't go to the toilet so much to have a wee. He said... At work for the last three years, I've gone ten times a day. And since we've been doing this work, I go two or three times a day. Now, that wasn't the reason he came, but it's a sign of the effect, if you're helping someone or in a rapport with someone, that the body responds, not just the psychological component that you're, you're treating. So I think it's... OK. It's... Um, I'm sorry to smile. I, I didn't need these notes, I knew. <laughs> A woman I was at dinner with many years ago said, oh, I understand you do hypnosis. And I said, yes. She said, well, I think it's no good at all. I said, well, that's fine. I, Why do you say that? And she said, well, I had an experience. I wanted to stop smoking. And I looked up this hypnotist in the yellow pages and I went to see him. And when he opened the door, I didn't have good feelings about him. Anyway, he closed the door and then he said, we're going here to do the hypnosis. And he opened the door and we went down to a cellar <laughs> and he locked the door. And then he said, I'd like you to sign this piece of paper that if anything goes wrong, it's not my fault. <laughs> this is true. And he said, before we do the hypnosis, I can guarantee I won't molest you while you're asleep. <laughs> now, this is true. Now, she thinks hypnosis is no good, but, you know, she was terrified and, and you know, anyone that did that... But that guy, I imagine, thought he was doing the right thing. He wasn't reading the, the body language of the person who obviously was very anxious. So having empathy and listening and having communication which is meaningful 
where what you say is heard by the person and what they say to you is heard by you. So they know you're on their wavelength. There's a joke where there was a mother who had two teenagers that um, were misbehaving and behaving like teenagers and staying in bed and not studying and stuff. And she had uh, lunch with her friends who told her that she should be harder with them and be more firm. So that night she said she's going to start to be more firm. So the next morning when they, the two boys ambled down to breakfast at 10 o'clock, she said to one of them, and what would you like for breakfast? He said, oh, I suppose I bloody Weetabix is useful. So she hit him across the face and she said to him, what are you having? He said, sure as hell I'm not having bloody Weetabix. <laughs> So being listening and hearing is a, is a major factor. Now the parts is a simple concept and I've taken it to a further degree which I use with many patients. And the parts just mean that the way we look at ourselves or the way we understand ourselves can be made into different parts of us doing something. And when you talk to people you'll hear it in a lot of conversations where they come out. So if I say... I'm in two minds as to whether to drink this water or not. That means there's two parts of me. One would like to drink the water and one wouldn't like to drink the water. Um, if I say I don't like myself, then there's two parts again. There's an I and there's myself. And so using that concept, we can extend it to be able to learn more about what's going on in this inner world. Any questions so far? Not sure whether you're just bored or you know it all. <laughs> anyway, I'll tell you some of the different parts and then I'll um, tell you about a case history where I've used the parts quite a lot and then we'll see if some people might like to come up and we can demonstrate how it may be helpful to use this concept. So two, of, two to start off with would be logic and emotion. They're two parts of us. So any situation, both those parts will be um, approaching what we should do about it. So people that come to us and say, often, or 99% of the people that see me anyway, it's about their emotions. It's very, there's very few that have logical problems, maybe obsessive compulsive do, but so most of the people are saying, I feel frightened, lonely, depressed, unhappy, angry, whatever. So that's the feeling part. So a lot of people come and they sit down and they, after I've taken their name and address, they say, Dr. Rowett, I know this is silly. So they're already starting to talk about their thoughts, their rational mind. I know this is silly, but I feel terrible when I go on an aeroplane. So they're already dividing themselves into two parts, the thought process and the feeling process. And what I believe is there's, there's three things there. There's the thought process, there's the feeling process and there's the lack of a connection. So if I feel that I'd like to go to this restaurant because I'm hungry and I think I won't go because it's very expensive, I'll then have a connection between the two and we'll work out between us whether we go or not. But we've worked it out by the thinking part and the feeling part debating you know, in an instant, no, I haven't got any money in the bank, we're not going, or yes, we just won the lottery, we're going. So it's, it's that that allows us to be able to utilise these parts um, in a way that they work as a team. The person who says, I know it's silly, but I can't go flying because I get terrified, means that there's no team. There's the terrified part saying, don't fly, because you had a bad experience before and you might die, and there's a rational part saying it's safe to fly, but there isn't a connection. So when I'm seeing people with that logic and emotion, I'm looking also for the connection to see if we can get the messages sent between the two. And there's a chap that I've seen that will demonstrate that. So it's two part. Another part that we have is a critic. And the critic tells us we're wrong and we should do it better and why didn't we do it that way? And the critic is very common and most people have it to some degree or other. When you have um, an extreme of something then it's very powerful and often 
these parts developed by um, when we grew up. There was a character, a parent or someone who had these characteristics and that was then brought into the system. So often when people have a, a strong critic, um, they say their father was like that or their mother, often their father. He never praised. You know, I got 70 for my uh, exam and he said that's not good enough and then I got 80 and he said you should do better and then I got 100 and he said it must have been an easy exam. So that, there are some parents that believe that criticism is the best for their children. It will help them to grow up and be strong. But I think it, it sort of is not good for a young child to be criticised all the time. One of the things that I am surprised about that is more English than Australian is that English people have great difficulty praising themselves. They really do. I mean, if, if I say run 10 miles, they'll do it. If I say praise yourself, they say I can't. How, how you're a, ling a lot of your English people, do you have difficulty praising yourself? Tell me why. Hmm? It's immodest. Immodest is not a word that I use a lot. <laughs> but anyway, what does it mean, immodest? I understand that, but what's... I mean, what would an immodest person be like? <laughs> Big-headed. Blowing your own trumpet. Yes, that's what I hear. Big-headed and blowing around trumpet. Arrogant. It seems so strange. Yeah. Not so nice to know. But we're not talking about it outside, we're just talking inside. Who'd know that? <laughs> it just seems so ridiculous. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I know and I'm, you know, I've had 30 years of hearing it, but I still am surprised that if, and I believe this to be true, if saying well done to yourself in your head is going to help you feel better and have a better life, it seems to be a pretty small thing to do. But people don't wish, and they all say what you're saying. I've not heard immodest before, but now, you know, blowing your own trumpet and we're up north and we never did that and we don't talk about feelings. There's a whole lot of stuff. But it just seems, if it's going to get you better, why not do it? But as you said, your parents don't encourage kids a lot and they give them to grow up like that and you don't say it to yourself anyway. No. Okay. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> no, no, you don't. Um, I'm going to say to you, would you look after a little girl of six for three months? And the only rule is you must criticise her all the time and never praise her. No. Now, her, her body language was this. Oh, you know, but she won't do it herself. Why would you do it for a little girl? No, serious. Why would you say to a little girl, well done, but you won't say it to yourself? But, but are you blowing her trumpet? And is that okay? <laughs> That's a strange system. Really, you know, if it's, it, could you say, could you say the words? Yes. Off you go. Well done. Was that difficult? No. I can say it now because I've been through this stuff, but I think it's at one point. Well, I'm glad you've gone through the stuff. It just, I mean, of all the things we do, a lot of them are difficult, they take time or whatever else. Well done seems to be a very small thing to get people to do. I've given up. I don't do it anymore. I say it and they say no and that's the end of it because they'll eventually say yes but they won't do it. Someone the other week, I spent a long time about it because I think he was very low self-esteem and it would benefit him. And I said, all I want you to do is three times a day for two weeks till we meet. All right, all right. And when he came back, he said, I did it twice one day. I mean, if people have got cancer, they don't go, oh, I'm not going to go and see anyone. They'll go miles. They'll take terrible medicines. Anyway, I'm not going to go on about that. But it's a good thing if you can get people to say, well, then I think it's a useful thing to do. Because the critic, the one that's saying they're no good, is in all of us to some degree. And we need to balance that critic with someone saying, no, I did well. It doesn't, you don't need to you know, win the race. You just need to be able to tie your shoes up and say, oh, well done. 
I don't think it matters what you're doing. I think the drip feeding of well done helps. So say well done to their friends. Say well done to their friends. Yeah. So how about teaching yourself a little bit to your friends? Yep. And they, they go, oh, they go to blowing the trumpet stuff. Well, you can find those well done things that they do. Interesting is a good word. It means nothing. Well, I'm <laughs> to anyway. No, no, but when I hear interesting, I, I say to them, you know, did you have a good day or did you read the book or something? Mm, it was interesting. You know, they, if, if it was good, they'd say, yeah, it was good, or I learned, or it was great, or something. But interesting seems to be a neutral word. I'm not, judge, I'm not judgmental about it. Just quickly, just quickly. Kind of two years. It was a long time in Australia. And I was trying, having been to someone's house, give someone compliments, they were physically unfriendly. She was very, very unfriendly. And they were always on the computer, and they'd come in for a drink, and she'd say, yeah, I'm going to be glad you said thank you. But I was raised in a very British place in Durham, so it was rude to actually go and say that. Is a, comp- is a compliment the same thing that people are embarrassed and don't want to say thank you? I think who I was raised to try to modestly regard, you know, uh, you know being polite and quiet and not, you know. So you're not immodest. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, now you are immodest. I think we'll form the immodest society <laughs> in Australia. Do you? And what do you think about it? Do you think it's a good thing to do? Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I, w- I run a small group to a psychiatric hospital um, and at the end of each group I do say, well done. And then very often they would say, oh no, it's, it's what you told us. And then I might say, well no, it's not the effort we've made or anything. But no, it's what you, know, what you told us and how we, you know, you've reformed a little bit and it was true. And so they yeah. liked it. So they can't take it. No. It's very Pity. Okay. So another, we have lots, the majority of people that I see anyway are warriors. I don't know, do you have people that come to you as clients, they're warriors? You know, I'm a born warrior, and, you know, and, and, and. if I didn't worry, I'd worry about not worrying. <laughs> so, so you're true point of view is no worries, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw the prawns on the barbie. Um, so, <laughs> so there is an extreme warrior, which is a catastrophizer. It's a word you may have heard. And the catastrophizer wields its power by using two words. What are they? What if? So if you're going in the parts, you know, learning to use the parts thing, if you ever hear a client say, you know, oh, I don't know why to do that, what if? I'd, I'd stop them and say, you know, you've got a catastrophizer living inside. And they'll look at you as if you're mad. And you just say, well, you know, what if is a part of you that's using doom and gloom to control you? Okay, and it's, it's, it's more difficult to reduce a catastrophizer. They seem to have more power. We have, this is my creation, we have a projectionist. Um, maybe, maybe I could demonstrate, is someone, anyone who's visual that would like to come up and, and talk about something where they're seeing something they'd rather not see? No? Okay. Okay. I'll pay you. I'll, I'll pay you your money later on. See, no one else has a guts. Pitiful. Well, no wonder they won't praise themselves. Okay. So you're good at visualising? Yeah, reasonably. Okay. I think so. Okay. There's a, there's a gradation of visualisation. There's those artistic sort of people that are fantastic. And there are those that can't see anything at all. And I'm one of those. I can only see black. I can't see anything. So it's no use using any visualisation on me or hypnosis using visual images because I can't have them. And there's a small percentage of people like that. Okay. So is there something that you'd like to change that you are seeing pictures that you think would be better seeing better pictures? Yep. Okay. You want to tell us or is it...? Um. Well, I think... Uh, <laughs> no, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what I was thinking about. I got all those as well. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think certainly um, I, I have uh, a talent. I wouldn't say a talent, really. Uh, yeah. uh, something that I do, which is to um, jump to 
a conclusion that may not be it would be better to be thought about first, right? Than actually, uh, I, I get kind of passionate about things. Yep. And I get kind of the hump. <laughs> okay. And if I think someone's being dealt an injustice or something, like that, I tend to uh, get a bit excitable about it. And you, you're happy with that? No, I'd like to tone it down a bit and think okay. before I leap for a little, at okay. least for a second. Okay. All right. So if you. If you close your eyes, just mm -hmm. not, there's no, not necessarily anything hypnosis. Can you see a picture of that, of you jumping to a conclusion too quickly? Yeah, you know the spitting image sketch of Norman Tebbit? Yeah. <laughs> That's about where I am. Okay. <laughs> okay. And what would you like to have instead of that? What picture would you like to see? Let's say, um, difficult one, that. Come on, give me some clues, people. Prophet 2-2. Who? Bishop 2-2. Two, two. Two, two. Uh, don't know who that is, sorry. <laughs> what did you say? Mr. Men. <laughs> but, uh, oh, give us some clues. What could, who could I be? What would be a bit more? Kermit. Kermit, yeah. Oh, I'm pretty good at that. I could do Kermit, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know someone. No, I, 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 like, okay, call yeah, him X. Yeah, well, you would know who he is. So, no, okay, yeah, all right. So if you close your eyes, mm -hmm. imagine you're in the cinema. Mm -hmm. You there? Yep. Whereabouts in the cinema? Just sitting in the seat in the cinema, mm -hmm. looking at the screen. Mm -hmm. And on the screen is the picture that you have been having. Yep. Okay? Can you see that picture? On yep. The screen? Okay. So you get up from your chair and you go to the back of the cinema where there's a projectionist room. Yep. And you open the door and you see the projector that's showing you that picture. Mm-hmm. And you see the person looking after the projector. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that person. Well, the person who's actually doing the projection? Yeah. 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 Actually, I've got the guy in the AV room there. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So you can see him there. Yep. And ask him, is he the person showing that picture on the screen? Okay. And tell me what he says. No. He's not. So ask him who is showing the picture on the screen. Oh, me. That's okay. weird. So that's fine. So there's part of Paul showing the picture on the screen. Mm -hmm. Ask the guy in the projectionist room, does he know where that part of Paul is? Who's in charge of the projector? Mm. No. He doesn't know where he is. No. You mean where, whereabouts inside me is? No, we're inside the projectionist room. Oh, if, I see. If he's showing the film, right. he must, one assumes, be there with the projector. Hmm. Ah, no, he says he was told to play it. Who was told to play it? That's <laughs> the right. projectionist. Okay, by Paul. It's part of Paul. Part of Paul, okay. Yeah. So, say you're Paul, mm -hmm. and this cinema is inside my head. Yeah. And I'm coming to talk to you as the boss, or mm -hmm. the, the landlord, um, and I'd like you to show another picture. Mm -hmm. I'd like to override that part of Paul that was um, telling you to show the picture that's on the screen. Mm-hmm. And ask him, will he do that? Yes. Okay, and get him to show whatever picture you'd like. Mm hmm. And how does that feel for you? Calmer. Okay. More rational, actually. Okay, and would that be all right to be calmer and more rational? Sounds dreadful. Yes, that'd be fine. Yeah, I know you can still have your character that's less calm and less rational, but at this, in this situation. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, that's fine. So say to the guy in the, that's doing the, the work there, say, well, that's great, and what I'd like to do is to meet up with you every night for five minutes just to see how the day has gone and to see that that new picture has been in process. Can and it involve alcohol? Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and ask him if he's okay with that. Yeah, he is. And are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. We're comfortable can, with that. Okay, then you can open your eyes. Okay. okay. So w it was very artificial, but the, the steps are to... <laughs> he's very art artificial. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, the steps are to, if someone's got a picture, say a picture of the plane crashing, and that's why they won't go on the plane, you go through those steps, which is to have the picture, or maybe a movie picture, on a screen with them in a cinema, then they go back to the projectionist room and find out who's showing the film, and find out why. And normally it's protection. The majority of times I've seen doing hypnosis with people that are having difficulties, the, the part is trying to protect them. 
so that they're showing a film crashing because they were on the plane six months ago and it shuttered a lot and they were worried, so they're protecting them. And, and negotiate with the projectionist to show a, a flight that's reasonable and they land safely and have a great holiday. So I, I'm happy to discuss it further. I was talking, well, I was talking to Paul. If, if anyone wants to, we can run some workshops some, some later date with, with these techniques um, because it's too, it takes longer than just going through them like this. Have you finished with me? I have. Good stuff. I feel much better now. Good. <laughs> so do I. <laughs>
that could change, you know, if you had a tablet you took it and suddenly you didn't want to commit suicide, it'd be a pretty good tablet. So I, I was trying to work out what went on and he said he'd been depressed for years and so I did a thing called the Affect Bridge. Do you know what the Affect Bridge is? Yeah, you take people back focusing on a feeling or a picture or something. So I said to him, if we're talking about this internal world, what, what's yours like? So he closed his eyes and he said, it's, it's a dungeon inside a castle. And to me that didn't sound a brilliant place to be. Um, so I said, what would you like to be? And he said he would like to be in a forest with trees and fresh air and sunshine. So I said, well, imagine the forest. And he said, I can imagine it, but then the castle comes back all the time, the dungeon, the dungeon, the dungeon. So I said, okay, focus on the dungeon. And I'm, he was 35, I think. I'm going to count back. And when the dungeon disappears, means when it's first come in your life, let me know. So I counted back 35. And when he got to 18, he said, it's gone now. He said, oh, now I know what it's about. And I said, what's it about? He said, when that terrible thing happened with the band and I was left out, I was so disappointed I created a dungeon around me to protect me from any future uh, experiences like that. And I've been living my life for the last 17 years just avoiding anything that might lead me up to being good at something because it was too painful. And I said to him, what was the parakeets about? And he said, well, my mother's a bird watcher and as I saw the parakeets I thought I'll tell my mother about that and he thought no I can't if I crash into the wall so I won't. So the connection he made with the parakeets and his mother helped him not to kill himself and the, correction, the connection he made with his early experience at the university allowed him to, we made the dungeon as big as the world so he's no longer in a dungeon and he's, he's now, he's not seeing me anymore, he said he feels fine and he's changed what he's going to do in his life and he's changing his band and lots of things. But that's an example of what's going on in this inner world of people and what is happening that restrict our lives and in his case. Any questions about that? No? Yeah. You don't say well done? <laughs> <laughs> is that just one session? No, no, that was um, four sessions. The second session we got to the dungeon and the, and the band thing. Um, Did you use hypnosis with him? It's a good question. I, I, I don't know about this thing called hypnosis. <laughs> I think we all, I, my induction is what I did with Paul. I say close your eyes. Um, I say two things. I say put your feet on the floor. Um, that's meaning something's going to happen because we normally don't say to our guests, put your feet on the floor. And then I say, close, you, close your eyes and go inside. And the only direction is not to try. There, that's my induction. Because I believe if you try, you're going to come. My simple view of hypnosis is that there's the conscious mind at the top, sleep at the bottom, and hypnosis and the altered state is in the middle. And I think when we try, we come up here into the conscious mind. So if, if people are just allowing it to happen, then I think it'll, um, they'll go into a trance. Or oh, some people won't, but the people that I work with, some of them do and some of them don't. But working with the parts, it's really their creative part and their imaginative part. And I think they're in a trance, but I, I don't want to get caught in this, am I hypnotised or not? I don't, and I don't like it when people say, I'm coming to you for hypnosis. It's more about visualisation. Yeah. Is PMR anything like PMT? <laughs> oh, no. I'm not good with, I was saying to Jenny, I don't understand these letters. And the whole of the, the, uh, the uh, meeting before was people talking to us, which I had no idea what they were talking about. I've got an allergy to it. No, it's not. No, I don't do that. I'm not saying it's a good thing to do what I'm doing, but I did a lot of that, and I found that what I do is much the same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I want to. I want them to ask because I don't. I want to know what's going on, and then I leave silence for them, uh, for them to do what I call good good work. 
I say, look, we've talked a bit about this, have some quiet time for yourself and then when you're ready, you know, we can continue talking. And a lot of people find that really helpful and some people prefer it if you keep talking. But it, it's again staying with the empathy. Yeah. Thank you. Why are you at the back? Oh, okay. <laughs> he said you're the projectionist. I agree, I agree with you, it's difficult. I think it's difficult, I agree. I, you know, I, I think that difficult doesn't mean that you can't do it, it's just difficult. And a lot of people say this is difficult or this takes time and I think some things are easy. Sometimes you can, like this bloke with the parakeets was easy. But a lot of people they've had 30 years of you know, upbringing where their parents haven't been that great. I don't think it's going to be changed um, in a short space of time and I think they need to be motivated to keep going to get little bits better, little bit better. But I think it is difficult. If people say something's difficult, I tend to agree. I think, you know, if I were there, I'd find it difficult too, I imagine. Okay. Um, another, sorry. Could you discover the dungeon? How did you go on from there? The dungeon. I then asked him to what he'd like, and he'd like this forest thing. He'd prefer a forest in his inner world than a dungeon. So that's when we found out that the dungeon's aim was to protect him. I see. So As yeah, and the two uh, subsequent sessions that you had with him. Yes. Um, what what did you do with him to enforce the the, the fact that he found out the forest the. He seemed to be okay. He didn't need. He seemed to be okay. He didn't. He said it's great. It's, I'm working on it. It helped a great deal, and it was a great session. And I didn't ever think of it, and a, a whole lot of stuff which I didn't want to be starting adding more stuff to him. I was really supporting him and said that's terrific, and I'm so pleased. And what will you do? His homework was to practice more drumming, which to me was a strange amount of homework when he just got out of a dungeon. But that's what he wanted to do. And for him it must have meant something which it didn't mean to me, or guitaring or whatever he was doing. Um, and that was his homework. And when I saw him the next time, that's why I asked him, did you do some more guitaring? He said, yes, I've got a room, I'm going to practice now and it's great. So whatever was going on with him, he knew and he was happy with. I didn't know, but I didn't need to know. Okay. Yes? I was going to say, sometimes when, when people have that, it's like an aha moment. Yes. Yep, it's great. It doesn't happen enough, but it's good when it happens. Um, the, the last one of the sort of things I was going to uh, say is a thing that I, when people remember things, um, they're often remembering things that they don't need to remember anymore. <coughs> you know, they stood up in class age 12 and they recited poetry and everyone laughed and it was terrible and now they're having trouble going to the best man at a wedding and giving a speech that sort of concept. 
and I say to them, is it, is it useful to remember that time when you were 10 and you kids laughed at you? He said, no, it's not, but I, you know, I can't get rid of it. So I say to them to imagine, going into the mind, to imagine the memory as a place that stores things that are useful. And they go, yeah, I can see that it's a big box or something. And then I say, I want you to imagine the forgettery, <laughs> which is another box, which is well used. We forget a lot. If I say to you what you had for lunch three months ago, that will be in the forgettery. And I'd like you to look in the memory and see what's there and see what you could take out and put in the forgettery. So that's another two parts that I use. The logic and the emotion. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you a case history, which... Excuse me one sec. Uh, yeah, here we are. There's a man that lost his temper a lot. And he wanted to see me about this. And uh, so I talked about the logic and the emotion. So he, he called it rational, which is fine. If, I, you know, if people say, I say the logical part, I say the rational, yeah, I always use their words because then I'm being with them. The rational part, he closed his eyes. I said, where's the rational part? He said, it's in my head. And I said, okay, what does it look like? And he said, it's an ice blue smooth box in my forehead. Okay. You need to be prepared for pretty strange creations. And it's probably best that they don't go and tell their wife or husband that they're talking to blue boxes in their forehead because they'll think they're mad and me mad. So it's really between... And they can, but I, you know, people don't understand it. So anyway, he had a rational part that was a, 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 an ice blue smooth box in the forehead. Now, to me, ice blue fits in with being rational. But I'm, you know, he could have been fiery red, but ice blue... I could, I could see that's a reasonable one for him. To, the emotion was a steam engine in his chest. So it's pretty strange. And the connection was a large rope like used to moor a ship to a key. Okay, so he's got ice blue here, a steam engine here, and a really, you know, pretty big rope connecting them. And I said to him, okay, are you happy with that? And he said, no, it's lousy because I keep losing my temper and I don't think that's a good system. So I said, well, what would you rather have? And he said, I'd like to keep the ice blue smooth box. The rope is too big. So I said, have some quiet time and see what you'd like to have there. So he spent, I don't know, two or three minutes. He went from the sublime to the ridiculous. He wanted a fibre optic cable the size of a hair. Very creative guy. And then I said, that sounds pretty good. And what would you like instead of the steam engine, which was the emotion? And he said he would like a small electric motor that was clean, quiet and efficient, which seemed pretty reasonable too. So I then left him with some quiet time to put in the ice blue he had, to put in the fibre optic, whatever that means, and to put in his silent... Um, Electric motor, yeah. And he spent a few minutes and he said, yeah, they're there. And I said, how does it feel? Because whenever you're doing any work, I think, you want to ask at the end of it, how does it feel? Because that's the main thing that's going to be driving them. If they think it's wonderful and how creative and they're feeling terrible, I don't think it's worked. So whenever I'm seeing someone and say, how's this going? What are you doing? And what's happening at home? How does it feel? I think that's a good question to ask. Anyway, so I asked him what it was like. He said the previous system with a steam engine was too large. It was pollution. It was jerking the rope, <laughs> which pulls the ice blue box around. So obviously it wasn't a good system. The old system, that system, went red and frightened people with outbursts, which was his anger. The new system is calmer. I feel better. I'm cool. The outcome is better. So that's an example of... Um, making a change in the parts. In this case, it's stem engines and ropes, but we'll do, I'll tell you about another case where we do something else. Any questions about that? Um, you mentioned that some people can't visualise very well, but yep. all the parts work the same as almost all visualisation. 
Yes, if they can't visualise, they can't do it. No. No. If you asked me about a system that's making me angry, I wouldn't have a clue. It would be feeling. So you can't do parts? I couldn't do parts, no. I, I could do parts if it was to do with tactile, I suppose. Or it might feel rough or something like that, but it's certainly not visual. Have you ever come across somebody who can't, like yourself, visualise yeah. and have to do something else? Yeah. And a lot of people don't do it. They think it's silly and they stop or they... Don't know what I don't know what you're talking about. You know, it, it doesn't. Th th what I'm telling you about are the ones that work pretty well, and maybe I don't know, twenty percent of the ones I do, or thirty percent. Uh, is it yeah. appropriate to say, um, "How about profanity?" I've tried that. I feel a bit uncomfortable with that. I, I you know, I can understand that, and I, I think it's a reasonable thing to do. If you asked me to pretend seeing a, a well, steam engine, I couldn't pretend it. But if someone said to you, what colour's your front door, um, what the process would go through? Me? Yes. If someone was to Can say I tell you a story? <laughs> He's a top... <laughs> 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 I, <laughs> I'm not very visual in life. I can't do it in my head, but I'm... I don't dress and I don't care what things look like and the rooms I'm in are not, the pictures don't necessarily be straight, etc., etc. And um, my wife is very, very visual. And um, so she'd come home and she'd say, Brian, do you notice something? And I, no, she said, I've had my hair done. So I'm bloody hell, I'm in trouble again. So then, then the, you know, the next month or something, she'd say, do you notice something? And I'd say, no, oh, I've had my hair done again. So I wrote in a book, hair done. If we asked to be noticed something, hair done. So I came home and she said, do you notice something? I said, yes, you've had your hair done. You're an idiot. The front door's been painted. <laughs> 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 so when you ask me about the colour of the front door, <laughs> obviously I don't know. <laughs> right, I wanted to tell you about a case that has got lots of different parts in it. It's a chap I like really well. He was going to come today, not necessarily to volunteer, but just to hear about parts, but he had something else on. His name's Tom. He's 52. He has two children. He's a warrior and a perfectionist. And he, we talked about that, and he's always been a warrior, and his father was very nasty to him, criticised him, gave him a hard time. And... In the first session, he said, I, I think my wife thinks I'm a bad father. And I talked to him about mind reading and what will people think. And I said, um, there, was, there was a guy who came to see me. I'm sorry, yeah, I've still got time. I've got, there's a, a guy that came to see me who was stammering. And I said to him, you know, we talked about stammering and I was doing some work and I said, well, what do your friends think about your stammering? And he said, oh, I wouldn't tell them I'm stammering. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you. And I laughed. And he, he got upset because I laughed. But I said, but you do stammer. He said, yes, but I wouldn't tell them I stammer. So I, I got in my head that it would be good for him to tell his friends he stammered. I don't know why. But I said, I want you to tell your friends. He said, well, I can't do that. So anyway, he came back the next week and we talked and I said, I want you to tell your friends. He said, no, they'll think I'm terrible. Anyway, after the third week of spending lots of money seeing me telling him to do something he's not doing, he said, all right, I'll do it. And I said, who will you tell? He said, my best friend, John. I said, OK, tell him and we'll see what he says. So he came back the next week. He said, oh, I had to go to the pub and have three pints before I told him. And I got him to the pub and I said, John, I want to tell you something very serious. He said, what? He said, I stand He said, yeah. He said, do you know? And he said, yeah, of course I know. He said, oh, I thought you'd be annoyed. So, and then his stammer got a lot better. It didn't cure his stammer, but it was a lot better. So, you know, sharing. This guy is saying that his wife thinks he's a bad father. So I said, well, why don't you ask her? Oh, you know, what if she, you know, you know. Anyway, I asked her and she said he was a terrific father. So that was a good start. And I talked to him about the warrior. And his worry was a black cloud in his head. And it started when he was 15. He had too much responsibility and his father criticised him all the time. He was never good enough. And he, I asked him to create a praiser. Now, he's English, but he was able to do it. 
he said, OK, and we, he created an upright man who was positive and encouraging, whose aim was to praise him and also to decrease the cloud. I've written down, I was quiet and I left him for 10 minutes. I didn't leave the room, but I left him to go with the praiser. And then he said, yep, yeah, he's there. So his homework was to do, um, tell his, ask his wife about being, uh, uh, whether he was a good father or not, and spend time with the praiser. Um, in the next session, he was doing really well. He said he was feeling a lot better. And I then talked to him about a future person. This is what I use quite a lot. Instead of talking about problems all the time, I say, when you're better and feeling OK, let's imagine that Tom. And he was very visual. And he could see that Tom who was happy and relaxed and not such a worrier. So I asked him, the homework was to talk to the Tom, the future Tom. Spend some time every day talking to the future Tom. When he came for the next visit, he said he was learning from experiences and he had a catastrophizer inside him, which was a seven-year-old boy that the father had given him a hard time and screamed and yelled at him and he started to worry, what will people think? So I, his homework for that um, week was to spend time with that child, helping the child realise that as a 52-year-old man, he doesn't need to worry about what people will think so much. When I saw him the next visit, which was the fourth visit, he said his anxiety had gone from 100 to 50 and he talked to his father in a positive way for the first time ever. Pretty good. He was someone that adds riders. I don't know if you know about riders. They're the bane of my life. People say it's a great week, but. I had a really good holiday, but. You know, you're, oh, <laughs> you're doing that all the time. So I asked him, and he does did riders in order to not you know, make a mistake. He didn't want to say it's going well because then if it failed, he'd feel terrible. So he said, I've had a good week, but. So I asked him to stop doing the riders and he talked to me a bit about his father who kicked his girlfriend on one holiday. Doesn't sound good. And um, he, he found time with the young Tom very helpful and he's found that he's growing up. He was seven, he's now 12 or 13. I asked him to write a diary of his positive experiences because he, if he'd had them, they'd gone. So he, every night, if he has a positive experience, he writes it in. And um, he came in the next time feeling very, very happy. He was the happiest I'd seen him. He said, I did something I'd never have done before. I said, what was that? He said, I helped a lady off a train with her pram. I said, really? He said, yes, I never would have done that. I said, why? He said, well, what would people have thought? And I said, what do you think people would have thought? He said, oh, they would have thought it was pretty silly or strange or something. I said, I imagine people thought it was a nice thing to do. Anyway, he did it and he just, it was the best thing he'd ever done. Now, this is a bloke who's 52, he's a lawyer, he's very competent and wouldn't help a lady off the train with a pram because he thought people think he's silly. The next week he was even more happier because he he was in the train and there was a spare seat and he said, does anyone want this seat? <laughs> and they all said, no, and he sat down. He'd never done that and people don't do that, but he was very pleased at doing that. So he was growing on his improvements and he, the last time I saw him, which was a few weeks ago, um, he was keen to, to know, a lot of people are keen to know what's going on knowing what's going to happen in the future or know whether it's correct or incorrect. And I said to him, it's, you've got a box on one side of your head which says this is right and you've got another box on the other side of your head which says this is wrong and I want you to put a box in the middle which says I don't know and it's okay to have that box. And I think that's a reasonable approach and he's doing that and he finds that very helpful to accept that he doesn't know some things. Okay, now that's, um, you know, that's enough for me. Any questions or any, anyone want to come up and we do a demonstration? We've got 10 minutes.
Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, I thought it was good to have that in between that don't know box because I've got a lady who's got, um, you know, the good girl and the bad girl when it comes to alcohol, and I'm trying to get her to perhaps have something in the middle. So that's a nice and concept what would she to adopt. Be? What would the girl in the middle be? Um, well, maybe. I don't want to say normal because then that's subjective as well, isn't it? But maybe, well, anything that would be of her choice, really. And uh, she'd probably be a good person to work with as well because she's um, an interior designer, so hopefully I could utilise that creative mind as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to ask you... Um, if you, how would you describe you had a, you said you had a cat and a dog yes and how would you describe them and when well, you describe one is a them cat it's furry and it's got a tail but, um, <laughs> what are you what are you actually seeing when you say oh, you're those talking about my visualization yeah. please don't do that okay I've, everyone comes after the talk and I'm sure you can see this and how do you dream and I've been to about twenty people I can't do it okay, okay. I'm That's not right. sure I'm why sorry. but I can't. But the cat's telling me what to ask you now. So I must have been able to see it. You, you said it. When you thought about hypnotising the cat and the dog, what were you hoping to achieve? What was the goal? I can't remember. I, he didn't tell me that. He just said hypnotise them. <laughs> I imagine they'd go to sleep. I suppose that's what it would be. You know, you do this and they go to sleep. I didn't have a name. Question Yeah. Uh, Brian, uh, we had a meeting the other night with a, a guy who was a speaker and he was talking on his experiences with OCD and he was a major catastrophizer. Uh, what if this, what if that? Um, you mentioned that obviously at the beginning of this last section. Can you just um, elaborate a bit more on how you would deal with that sort of approach sure. on, on what if? Sure, Do we have any catastrophizers here? <laughs> Not you again. Anyone who'd ha who's aware that they've got what if going on in their head all the time? Yep. Could you come up? Uh, is that okay if we use, in yeah. answer to your question, we use... Yes, thank one? you. Yeah, that's great. I think while he's coming up, being aware is really good advice to your clients. <laughs> to be aware of what's happening inside. What are they feeling? What are they thinking? You know, what are their pictures? What are they telling themselves, mainly? Because if you can be aware of it, you have a better chance of changing it. Okay. Hi. Matthew, we've met before. Matt. Matt. Okay. So you, you have a catastrophizer, is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a reasonable one yeah. in my circumstances. Okay, what would we call him? Uh, scary Matt. Sc <laughs> scary. No, but what's he doing to you? Uh, what's he doing? He's coming up with um, reasons why I might be ill. Okay, he's telling you you might be ill if you do that sort of thing, is it? Or? No, he's saying um, I've had, uh, I was diagnosed with lymphoma, so he's, he's coming up with things as to why the chemotherapy hasn't worked and why, um, okay. you know, what is this lump and okay. why I'm really itching and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so can you hear Matt? Okay. Is that it's working? Probably a good thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's working. So let's speak into that. Okay, I'm with that. So Matt has a, a, an extreme worry. He's not a what if -er, but he, uh, Matt has had. Lymphoma and, lymphoma and has been treated and this character is telling him well, watch out for that lump or be wary of that or that won't work. Is that... Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. And part of that's useful because it, it, the lymphoma is going to come back at some point. Uh, so, and they told me, you know, keep a lookout okay. uh, for anything that might... So he's keeping too much of a lookout? Yeah, yeah. You'd rather he kept less of a lookout? Yes. Okay. So, and you know about him, where he lives and etc. etc. Not really, no. Okay, so no. If, if you put your feet on the floor and close your eyes and don't try, and as if you're asking, um, you know, well, this person who's an extreme warrior, you know, when he appears, let, let me know then when you can see him. Okay. Okay, and whereabouts is he living inside you? Uh, he's in my chest. Okay, great. And what does he look like? Uh, he seems to have taken the appearance of a kind of devil, a kind of a slightly cartoon-like devil type okay. creature. So, and say to him, would it be all right to have a chat? Okay. And we're not trying to punish him or blame him. We're, we're, we're trying to learn, so it's, he doesn't need to be worried that we're against him. Okay? And ask him what his name is. Okay. 
Thready. Thready, okay. And ask him, when did Thready become part of Matt? Um, last year. Okay, and I'd thank him for letting us know. And ask him, what's his aim? Uh, to help me. To help you, okay. And does he believe he is helping you? Yes. Okay. And could you let him know your view of it, that you, you, know, you may be able to do a lot of that yourself without him uh, influencing you? Yes, he's a bit resistant to that. Idea. Yep. Okay. Can I just talk to you while you're sitting there quietly? Is that right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's of interest, if you do this sort of work, to be aware of the character of the character. And sometimes the character says, bugger off, I'm not going to speak to you. And other times they say, sure, I didn't realise and I'll help. And you have a gradation of characters and, and you need to deal with them in a way to try and see if you can help them. And with some characters, I ask the person to tell them to fuck off. And the, the patient normally opens their eyes and goes, what? And then, because if you are dealing with someone in life, say you've got a, a flat and the tenant is breaking all the furniture and you go around to evict them and they lock the door and punch you in the nose, you're not going to sort of talk calmly to them. You'll go to the law or whatever. And my experience with these characters, if they're of the extreme, a lot of them, they don't talk to you. They go, no, I'm not talking to you. And so you know that you've not got, um, like what I call a team, you and the character working together. They're working in different ways. So you may have to escalate how you deal with it. But I'm not saying that's the case with Matt's one. OK, so what, what would you like him to be like? How would you like him to improve so you could work it with him as a team? Um, I'd like him to tone it down a bit. OK. So ask him, would he be OK if he did that? Yes. He's, he still seems quite resistant to the idea. OK. Yeah. Ask him, does he know that what he's doing is actually causing some problems rather than helping? Yeah, he doesn't seem to care. He doesn't care. So he's not worried about Matt? Uh, yes, he is, but in a fairly simplistic way. Okay. Are you happy with him being the guy in there that's looking after you? Not really, no. Okay. You could say to him, and I'm not trying to move into therapy as a demonstration, but what I would do is say, look, there's two choices. You can either change so we work together or you go. What's his response to that? Uh, he's going to go. OK. Is that all right with you? I think so. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm ambivalent. OK. Is there someone, some other character that you prefer to have there that would help you? Uh, yes. OK. What sort of character would that be? Probably more helpful or caring. <coughs> OK. Supportive. OK. And do you know such a character? Uh, I can visualise one. Okay. And what's that character like? Um, more like a nurse. Mm -hmm. And where would she be living or he be living? Same place. Okay. So have you invited, is it a female nurse or a male nurse? Female. Yeah. Have you invited her in? Yep. Is she there? Mm -hmm. And is the other character still there or is he gone? He's in the background more. Okay. So I would say to her, you know, I'd like to work with you and, and you and I will work out what's best for me. And also part of her job is to keep the other character in the background and ask her, is that okay with her? Yes. It is. And say to her, I'd really like to meet up with you two or three times a day for a few minutes just to see that we're on track. Is she okay with that? Yes. And are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Is there anything more you'd like to do before you come back into the room? No. Okay. So I'd say to her, we'll meet later on tonight and we'll have a chat and see how she's getting on helping you and keeping the other character in the background. 
and then you can come back into the room. Okay. So stay for a sec and we'll see. Any questions of Matt? Um, <coughs> it felt reassuring. Um, it, it was all a little bit bizarre because of this, the, these characters weren't what I expected them to be like or uh, rationally. Um, but yes, it felt reassuring, definitely. I think, for, like in Matt, we're not doing therapy, and I apologise if that's what it seems to be, but Matt's got the lymphoma, he's worried it may come back, and this guy is protecting him. So saying to the guy to go away is not, you know, I'd be worried too. So it's not an easy thing to change. And it's, it's, I hope that the nurse will do the same thing and it'll be better and it'll work. But I can understand Matt going, well, I'm not really sure. Do you ever get bad reactions of people being kind of very scared about imagining something? No, no. Character? I've never had an amber reaction in 30 years. That's true. I, I, I suppose I'd like it if it happened, but it's not happened. I mean, in that it means something's happening. Okay. Um, well, if we're talking parts, I suppose a part of me thought it was pretty daft and I felt a bit embarrassed about it being up here. Uh, but another part felt that it was actually very helpful. Thank you very, very much, much for coming out. Really, yeah, really you. helpful. <laughs> thank you for being a great audience. I'm sorry I've gone over time, but I did well.